Hey there! Is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community, and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So, no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So, welcome to church, and Happy Easter. morning and so I want you to stand with me this morning and we had a great number at our seven o'clock sunrise service so we appreciate those coming back boy you get an extra credit today for coming back for round two so we had a good time in the Lord good fellowship afterwards and we're so thankful uh, for you to be here with us today if you're joining us online today thank you for worshiping with us today if you are a guest thank you for worshiping with us this morning before you leave make sure you stop by our welcome table and uh, there's a little welcome card there. Maybe some in front of you you can drop off on our welcome table on your way out. We'd love to get to know you and your family. I'm going to read a few verses in, in Matthew chapter number 28 this morning. Verse 1 says, Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. 
And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you see Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is arisen as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. Amen. Amen. Let's pray this morning. Father, thank you for the hope that's only found in you because you conquer death, hell, and the grave. Father, we have nothing to fear. No matter what comes our way, Father, our hope is anchored securely in Jesus and Jesus alone. God, thank you for this week, this weekend. We're so thankful for all that you accomplished, Father, as we came together on Good Friday and got to reflect on the cross of, of your Son. And God, yesterday we got to meet new families and serve our children. Father, what a great time it was. But today, Father, we celebrate the risen Savior. God, we worship you. God, the omnipotent King of kings, Lord of lords. God, it's our desire to lift you up today, for you alone are worthy of our praise. God, be with our choir this morning. God, be with our musicians, our special singers. I, I, I pray everything we say and do today, God, will bring a smile to your face and glory to your name. Father, we love you. We worship you. There's none like you. And we ask all these things in Jesus' precious and powerful name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated this morning.
I'm going to ask our ushers to make their way to the front at this time for our, our offering. We have done our very best to worship in song this morning. Now we get to worship in giving. And so while, as the uh, offering plates are coming by, uh, Miss Kathy's going to come and sing a song uh, for us. So let's pray over the offering uh, this morning. Father, thank you, God, for all that you have done. Because you live, there's nothing we cannot face. God, we thank you for your faithfulness, your nearness. God, I pray, God, you continue just to do what only you can do. God, thank you for the opportunity to give back a portion of what you have given us. God, you have given all. Father, I pray we'll be found faithful in, God, what we've been given. God, take every penny, every dime, every dollar that comes forward. God, multiply it tenfold. It's our desire and our heart to reach our neighborhood and our nations with the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. We ask all these things in your precious name. Amen. Amen.
have our children come around this time for our children's change offering. Jerry, you play some good giving music this morning. For our children to come at this time and help us out. There you go. If you have a child from around two years to five years of age, you can send them to my right. We have a few ladies that will take them downstairs for little lambs. And uh, just make sure you pick them up at the end of service, all right? And so they'll make their way here to my right. The rest of us can stand and worship together this morning.
the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name. I reminded our choir this morning that they're on the World Wide Web. So if you fall asleep, they're going to see you. All right? It's good to be in God's house today. 
I love Easter Sunday. Something special about this week. But you know, as Christians, do you know every day is Easter Sunday for us? Every day is a reminder that we don't have to live in fear of the death, in fear of the grave. No matter what happens to us, everything has been conquered by the King of kings and Lord of lords. Because He did not stay dead, He got up and defeated death, hell, and the grave. Amen? Today I want to share with you for the next few minutes some, some good news. Literally, I want to share with you the gospel according to the scripture. That word gospel means good news. All right. And so uh, in order to understand and appreciate the good news of the gospel, I must first share with you some not so good news. How do we get to this weekend of Easter? Why, what is the big deal about Easter Sunday and, and Good Friday and the, and the Holy Week? You see, Easter Sunday is all about victory and hope and deliverance. But before there was deliverance, there was disobedience. Before there was redemption, there was first rebellion. And before there was victory, there had to be death first. We got together with our church family and some folks in our community Friday night for our Good Friday service. We took a few moments together just to remember and reflect upon the cross of Calvary. When the King of Kings gave His last breath, shed His blood for you and for me. And we ended the service saying it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Guess what folks? It's Sunday. He is no longer dead. We serve a, a King of Kings who is alive and doing very well on His throne on high. But before we get to the garden tomb that gets all the attention on Easter Sunday as it should, there was another garden that I want you to look at back in Genesis. Genesis chapter number 2 and 3 this morning. For something happened in the Garden of Eden that put everything we celebrate today into motion. Look with me. I'm going to read some background verses there in chapter 2. Then we'll get to Genesis chapter 3. All right, In Genesis chapter 2, look in verses 15 and 17. It says, Then the Lord God took the man, Adam, and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Here, God gives Adam a direct set of instructions, some boundaries, saying, I've done all this for you. I created a garden for you. Everything at your disposal is yours except one thing. And Adam was much like you and I. And I know if I tell my boys, you can have all this, but don't do that. You know what they're going to do? Do that. We're much of the same. If you go to the park, folks, and, and someone has just painted the, 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 the shelters there, the tables, and it says, wet paint, do not touch, what do we do every single time? I just want to see if it's wet, right? At our very core, our very essence, we are sinners. We are wretched, filthy sinners, and there's nothing good in us. But notice what happened after God gave him instructions. Look over in chapter 3 of Genesis, verse 1. Now the serpent, we know that was Satan, was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. It's here in Genesis chapter 3, if you're taking notes today, we see the dawning of sin. 
God had just given Adam some specific instructions what to do, what not to do back in chapter 2. But Adam crossed the boundary. He crossed the line. That word sin means to miss the mark. God had marked what was right and wrong and Adam chose to disobey God. You say, Pastor, didn't, uh, didn't Eve eat of the fruit first? She did, but she was deceived. Friend, Adam sinned with his eyes wide open. He made the decision to do what was wrong. And when he crossed the line that God had, had drawn from him, sin entered into this perfect world that he had created and called good. There was no sin in his creation up until this point. But because Adam was much like you and much like myself, he made the decision to rebel against the authority of God. And now we see the dawning of sin. Romans 5.12 says that, tells us that through one man sin entered into the world. James in the New Testament tells us what sin is. It says to him who know to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Adam willfully disobeyed, rebelled against God. And as a result of Adam's decision here in the garden, folks, everything changed. Everything changed. If you read the rest of of Genesis and throughout the Bible, you'll see the genealogies mentioned. And they all have something in common. It says so-and-so lived and then died. So-and-so lived and then died. We see death entered into the picture which brings us to our second point today we not only see the dawning of sin but we see the devastation of sin notice what Adam and Eve sin did it brought shame sin always brings shame doesn't it I want you to notice the contrast in Genesis 2 25 and then later in chapter 3 in chapter 2 verse 25 it says and they were both naked there in the garden the man and his wife, Adam and Eve, and they were not ashamed. You see, they're in a perfect world, perfect creation. Before sin, they, they beheld God's beauty, behold, beheld God's glory so much that they didn't even realize they were naked. The glory of God was so incredible there in the Garden of Eden. But notice what happened after Adam and Eve willfully disobeyed God. Look in chapter 3, verse 23. And 24. I'm sorry, chapter 3, verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. You see, before that, they didn't, they didn't. A new mind so we can behold all. All the beauty that one day will be before us in eternity. But now when sin entered the picture for the first time, they noticed themselves naked and they were ashamed. And so they made fig leaves to cover themselves. You see, sin always brings shame, but it also brings separation. Look in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. Sin separated them from the presence of God. In verse 8 it says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. You see, in that perfect world, pre-sin, God began to walk and talk in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve. Could you imagine having that relationship? Folks, one day we get to do that too. In our new heavenly home one day, when sin cannot enter there, so we have a perfect relationship. But when sin entered into this perfect world that God created, it separated them from the presence of God. Because they were ashamed, they hid themselves from the face of God. Sin also separates us from the blessings of God. Look in verse 23 and 24 of chapter 3. It says, Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground, from which he was taken. Talking about Adam. So he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Sin separates us from the presence of God. Now that relationship they once enjoyed walking and fellowshipping and talking 
in the cool of the day every day has now been broken because of man's willful disobedience and rebellion against God. There were some major consequences for Adam and Eve's sin. We find those in, in verses 16 through 19. In verse 16, to the woman Eve, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Now, ladies, those of you who have had children and you experienced those, the pains, you can thank Eve right here. She's the culprit, all right? In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband. He shall rule over you. Verse 17, then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it. All the days of your life, both thorns and thistles, it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the herb of the field. I don't know about you, but I'm a weirdo, and I like to do landscaping. I like to mow. I like to do some things. But I don't like some of the thorns and the thistles that you got to do. I love roses, but to get good roses, you have to fool with the thorns. And every time I, I get stuck and I get, break my finger, I think of Adam. It ain't happy thoughts of Adam. And it's because here it's cursed. But the greatest curse ever, the most devastating consequence of Adam's actions is found in verse number 19. It says, In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. Notice this. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Romans chapter 5 verse 12 says, Therefore, just as through one man's sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. Did you catch that? Because of Adam's sin, death was spread to all men. That was the greatest, most devastating consequence of Adam and Eve's decision in the garden. Now because he did willfully disobeyed, Sin entered to the world, and now it was spread. It was contagious to all men, all women that's ever been born post-Adam. You know how many of that was? Everybody. That includes you and me. Your Romans chapter 3 in the New Testament says, All have sinned and come short of, of the glory of God. We've fallen short of God's standard of perfection. You see, it's, it's bad enough that we're all born sinners but I'm here to tell you there's some worse news than that. Not only are we all born sinners, but we're all born with a sin debt. We just read about it that must be paid. And the Bible tells us the wages of sin is what, church? Of death. Death spread to all men. For the wages of sin is death. Now this brings about a great dilemma, doesn't it? A great dilemma we are all born sinners. We all have a sin debt. We all deserve to die. God demands perfection. We cannot meet His standards. So we have a, a great dilemma. We see the dilemma of our sin. You see, friend, God is a perfect and righteous God that demands per perfection and righteousness. And the only way that we can meet God's standard is to live a perfect, sinless, spotless life. How many has done that before? If you raise your hand, you're a liar, right? All of us have missed the mark. None of us can live up to God's standard because we're all wretched and there's nothing good within us. The Bible says none are righteous, not even one of us. And Isaiah goes on to say our righteousness is as filthy rags. If you've met somebody that has this idea that that when they get to heaven, God's going to weigh their good works versus their bad works. And if their good works outweighs their bad works, they're going to be ushered into heaven. Folks, that's not what the Bible teaches us. We cannot do anything good enough to meet God's standard of perfection. There's nothing we can do. So then what do we do with this dilemma that we're in? Absolutely nothing. Because Christ did everything and this is where the bad news starts to become some really good news this morning because God loves you with such a love that we cannot begin to fathom he refused to leave us in our helpless and hopeless 
dilemma this morning. He sent his only son, Jesus, to, on a rescue mission to rescue us from our sins and from ourselves. You see, Christmas begins what Easter celebrates. This great dilemma, God refused to leave us in because now we see the deliverance from sin. God sent his only son, Jesus. Go back to Genesis chapter 3 real quick. There's something that you cannot miss here as we look at the deliverance from sin together. Look in verse number 21 of chapter 3. It said, also for Adam and his wife, notice this, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Did you get this when you read this passage before? Here in Genesis 3, 21, God gives us the first glimpse of what's to come a few thousand years later for an innocent animal here in chapter 3 had to die to provide the tunics, the clothing that God used to clothe Adam and Eve. Can I remind you about 2,000 years ago, there was another innocent, spotless Lamb of God that gave His life on the cross of Calvary as the greatest and last sacrifice needed for the sins of mankind. You see, here in chapter 3, verse 21, it, it foreshadowed what was to come on the cross of Calvary. In the New Testament, Paul writes, he, God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. As God clothed Adam and Eve there that day in the garden, he will also clothe us in his robe of righteousness when we put our faith and trust in Jesus' work on the cross of Calvary. You see, the blood of Jesus covers our sin. It covers our shame so that when God looks upon us, He does not see our sins and our shame. He only sees the blood of Jesus. Amen? He wraps us up in His robe of righteousness. You remember that dilemma that we were in? That God demands perfection, yet none of us are perfect? That we're all sinners and deserve death? as a result of our sin, how we can never make our way to God on our own? Well, here's the really, really, really good news this morning. Jesus made a way for us to be reconciled to God, to be right with God, for He became the way for us to become reconciled to God. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 8 through 11. It'll be on the screen behind me. It says, But God demonstrates His own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Out through Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. In Ephesians 2 verse 13, Paul writes, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You guys remember when you were far off from Christ, out living your own way, doing your own thing, not giving a God the second thought, and all of a sudden He captured your soul, captured your heart, and you repented of your sins and you turned? Now He has brought you near. How? By the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. He is our reconciliation, that perfect, that sinless life that God Required of you and me that we could not live. Guess who lived that life for you? Jesus did. Jesus was born of a baby. He, he took on flesh and lived a perfect life for 33 years. He walked upon this earth and was tempted in every way as you and I are. Yet he did not sin. He could not sin because he was 100% God while he was 100% man. That's one of the great mysteries of the Bible. 
He lived a perfect life that we could never live. Remember the penalty for sin? What was it, church? The wage of sin is what? Death. You deserved to die on the cross. I deserve to die. But God, who is rich in love and mercy, took our cross and paid the penalty for your sins and my sins. Why? Because He loves you so much. He paid the penalty. Sin debt was paid in full. When Jesus hung on the cross and cried out, It is finished. There's nothing you and I can add to or take away from His work. We can't add to it. It's already been completed. All we must do is accept it and put our faith and confidence in what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. Very quickly this morning, there's something very significant that happened while Jesus was upon the cross. Matthew chapter 27, verse 50 and 51 says this, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earthquake and the rocks were split. Do you notice what happened there in the temple? The veil was ripped from top to bottom because before the cross church, we were cast out of God's presence. But because of the cross, we're invited in to God's presence. You see, there's no need for us to have to go through a priest or someone else now. Now we can come boldly to the throne room of God. He wants a relationship with you. So when he said it is finished, sin, sin debt was paid in full. Now we are restored. We Jesus endured the wrath of God so that you and I might experience the love of God. You remember on the cross when he hung there, taking your place and my place? Perhaps the hardest thing that he had to endure was when his own father turned away and he cried out from the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because God cannot look upon sin. And there as Jesus hung on the cross, He became sin. Every sin that you committed, every sin you will commit, was placed on Christ. And He who knew no sin became sin for us. Why? So that we might have the righteousness of God through Him. What a Savior our King of kings and Lord of lords is. No greater love has any man than that one who gives his life for his friends. Jesus willfully gave his life for you and me. But the gospel does not end at the cross. If the story ended here, if the gospel ended with Jesus breathing, his last breath on the cross of Calvary, our religion, Christianity, would be no different than any other religion on planet Earth who has founders and leaders who, who, who was born and lived a great life, led well, and then died. But our king is unlike any other leader that's ever been before. We're the only religion on planet Earth whose founder and leader is still alive and alive forevermore. They could not kill the king. And so notice what happened here at the end of the cross. He went to the, the tomb, and we read the passage this morning, but I'd be remiss if I didn't read it for you again in, in Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 8. It said, Now after the Sabbath, at the first day of the week, began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. And here's the rest of the story. He is not here. 
He did not stay dead, for he is risen as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples words. Friends, that is some good news. We were all born sinners. We all had a sin debt. But Jesus came and paid all the sin debt, everything on your behalf. And now when they tried to kill him, they could not keep him in the ground. He got up that third and victorious day. But here's the thing I want to leave you with today. The gospel is only good news to those who hear it in time. Notice here in verse 7, the angel said, go and tell. That's what we've been commissioned to do, church, is to go and tell this world that what Jesus has done for us and what Jesus can do for them and that he wants a relationship with them. We are commissioned to go and tell. I said the gospel is only good news to those who hear it in time. If you have heard this sermon today, folks, hear me and hear me well. You are now without excuse. You have heard the gospel according to the word of God this morning. You heard why the true story, why we celebrate Easter Sunday, why we look to the cross on Good Friday. It was not for any other reason but because God desired to come rescue you and rescue us. From our sin. My desire is everyone under the sound of my voice to have a thriving, growing relationship with Jesus. I share with our church family all the time, we live in a religious community. An area where religion, it seems like everybody's saved if you ask them. But very few people are living a thriving life joyful, has a relationship with Christ. Folks, if you do not have a relationship with Christ today, I implore you, I encourage you to understand and comprehend what Jesus did for you. Jesus loves us so much that if we had been the only one on planet Earth, He would have done all that for us. Because he loves us with a love that we cannot begin to fathom. Folks, this is the angel told the women that day, go and tell. Jesus would soon commission his followers before he ascended to heaven to go into all the world and preach the gospel. I don't have to remind you today that I believe we're living in the last days. I believe we're living in the last hours of the last days. May the church have a sense of urgency. Folks, we heard the good news. We don't have to die. When I don't get too excited about that. We don't have to die. Well, as Christians, when we breathe our last breath, folks, that's when our lives begin. Don't threaten me with heaven down here. We have a job to do, and until God calls us home, let's go and tell this community and the world that Jesus loves them to death. Let's stand to our feet this morning and pray. I'm going to have Jerry come and play a verse of invitation. Father, I've done my very best to share, God, with your children, the good news of Jesus Christ. God, thank you for all that you have done for us God you love us with a love that we cannot even begin to fathom God you went all the way to the cross of Calvary and paid the sin debt God that we owed God we could not meet your standards so Jesus came and lived a perfect life God faced temptations every day like we were yet he did not sin Father, and they killed him. 
He did nothing wrong. God, thank you for the cross. Father, we thank you for your son's blood upon the cross of Calvary. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. But Father, we're so thankful that he did not stay dead. But God, you raised him up in victory that third and appointed morning. And Father, I pray, God, as, as your followers, God, we'll have a sense of urgency to go about our community wherever you take us on our job tomorrow, this week. God, may we go and tell the world what you can do with them. God, there's no sin you cannot forgive. God, we cannot out the grace of God. So I pray if there's anyone today that does not know you, that today will be the day they confess their sins and make you Lord of their life. And God, if there's Christians here today that have, have not been urgent with the gospel message to share it with those around them, may we have boldness. God, forgive us of our apathy, our sins of omission. God, help us today with your head bowed and eyes closed. I wonder if anyone here today can be honest. Say, Pastor... Maybe it's the first time I understand what the gospel is. I've never put my faith and trust. I don't have a relationship with Christ, but I'd like to have one. You just raise your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. That's me. I see one. Anyone else? Pastor, pray for me. I don't have a relationship with you. If you raised your hand this morning, I invite you to come. Someone will meet you here at the altar and show you how you can have a relationship with Christ. I wonder how many Christians this morning would be honest and say, Pastor, pray for me. I haven't had a sense of urgency about sharing the gospel like I should, but I want to. How many Christians say, Pastor, pray for me that I may go and tell this week on the job. I see those hands. Father, give us more boldness. Give us a sense of urgency to go share the good news of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Some are praying right where you're at. Obey God. If you raised your hand, I'd love to take my Bible and show you how you can have a relationship with Jesus. Christian, if you've not been telling the, the good news, determine. Right there where you stand, ask the Lord to give you boldness to go share with somebody this week. Could you imagine if every family in here would just reach one person over the next 30 days? It would transform our church inside out. It would transform this community inside out. I say, do it, Lord. Church, it starts with us. May God help us. Father. I've done my very best this morning, God, to share the good news of the gospel. What a wonderful Savior you are. You do not leave us in our dilemma, but Father, you sent your Son to deliver us from our sins. Thank you don't seem to, <laughs> doesn't seem adequate. But Father, we thank you for all that you do that you have done, that you continue to do. God, help us to have a sense of urgency. God, to share the good news with somebody this week. God, help us not to succumb to, to fear and worry and doubt. But God, may we just go speak boldly for you. Share with this world, this community, our story. For our story is really your story. Father, we thank you that there's forgiveness found in you. There's new life in you. And Father, we are so thankful today. There is life after death because of you. We cannot wait to see you. We cannot wait to worship you and serve you for all of eternity. 
God, what a day it's going to be when we're united with our loved ones. But most of all, Father, as we fall at your feet, Father, and worship you forever and ever. But until that day comes, God, help us to be found faithful, busy about the Father's business. And when you call us home, what a day it's going to be. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated just for a couple minutes. I want to have Nick come at this time. He's going to Um, May 15th, we got folks that, uh, that are desiring to be baptized. We've si- seen some, some folks give their lives to Christ for the last few weeks, and we rejoice in that. And so we can't wait to rejoice with them on May 15th. If you have been saved and not been baptized, please see me. We'll talk about taking that next step in your faith journey. So make sure there's a few other things. There's some things about journey camp. Tyler and Jill will be sharing more about that in the coming couple weeks. And uh, so Nick, won't you come and share with us? about Bible school coming up. I'll make this quick, especially the ones in the balcony. There's, I just now noticed there's about a 20 degree temperature change when you come down here. I'm gonna take care of you guys. Uh, May 22nd through the 26th, 34 and a, actually to be precise, 34 and a half days from now, uh, we will be having Bible school. Uh, I shared some statistics a few a month or so ago. Uh, as we were having one of our Bible school meetings, we came across uh, we came across the uh, we came across some stats. Can you hear? Okay. We came across some stats. 2004, we had 62 enrolled. 2005, we had 110. 2006, we had 180. 2007, we had 227. (coughs) 2008, we had 269. After that, it got pretty hectic. We have, uh, we have had well over 300 here. Uh, at 2008, it got so hectic that uh, I, for, I would go home and forget to put my stats in the computer, and, and from that point on, I mean, it was, it was let's have fun. So, uh, and I started to cry because that's that was God at work, and uh, uh, had lots of help. So. Uh, there's a list with the bulletins. The uh, VBS committee has uh, met. You've been put in a teacher position. If you get one of those lists and don't see your name, uh, don't be upset with us because there's still plenty of slots to fill, uh, especially on bash night, uh, snow cones, cotton candy. Remember the Duncan booth, whoever wants to get wet. Uh, uh, we've got we've got plenty to do. There's plenty. Uh, if, if you can't be here that week decorating, uh, Whitney and Kathy, they've been such a blessing to help us decorating over these years. See them. They will help you uh, put you in a place where you can uh, help decorate. Shirts, a little been some confusion over the shirts. Uh, the shirts have been ordered. Uh, You can go online and pay for the adults, uh, the helpers, workers, can go online and pay for their shirts. This sort of helps offset the cost for the kid shirts. Uh, You can pay in person. Uh, Dustin, me, Christy, Lena, Becky, some of the uh, VBS committee, and uh, we'll mark that off. Uh, They're different colors for two different reasons. well, the main reason is the teachers have one color, the kids have another, and uh, that way if there's trouble, kids know who to go to. So that helps us when you get that many people involved, uh, it, it makes it easier for the kids to identify. Uh, 
in the upcoming weeks, next couple of weeks, teachers will be getting a packet with a layout of where the classes are, a list of the rules of what we're going by, uh, uh, everything that the VBS committee is expecting from the teachers. Uh, you also be getting your material. Am I forgetting anything? Uh, I'll leave you guys with this. I left you with a story the last time I told you that uh, you, some of you all would leave and you'll get it going down the road and you're going to get this one going down the road. <laughs> These are true stories. <laughs> <laughs> and Dustin just sets himself out there for me to tell these stories about. Uh, so when that, now I told this story when Dustin first came here. Uh, again, it's true. He wanted to go out and see some of the parts of the uh, county. Uh, he he is a country boy in a way, but in another way, well, you understand. Uh, <laughs> so I took him, showed him some property, and we was walking around. It was getting close to the edge of dark, and I said, let's go, Dustin, let's get back. And he was having a ball, and as we got close to the vehicle, there was a hole in the ground, and when I say hole, it was big, and he said, that wasn't there when we walked up the hill, and I said, no, I didn't notice it. So first thing he did is pick up a rock and throw in it. He said, Nick, I didn't hear that hit, and I said, I didn't either. So I, naturally, I picked up a rock and threw, and I turned around, and Dustin had a big rock, and he threw me in, and he was making it. I mean, he was so excited, and I was enjoying watching him. He's like a little kid. And, and uh, he turned around, and he said, Nick, here's a railroad tie. Let's throw that in there. And I'm like, okay. So we grabbed that railroad tie, and we slung that railroad tie in, and all of a sudden, in the edge of the woods, we heard something like it was at a dead run. And keep in mind, it was right at the edge of the dark, and a goat come running out of the woods and jumped in that hole. He said, what in the world? I said, I don't know. But at the same time, we heard somebody hollering, hey, hey. Dustin said, who is that? I said, I don't know. Well, farmer come out and he said, uh, I asked, I said, could we help you? And he said, yeah, I'm looking for my goat. It was tied to a railroad tie. <laughs> <laughs> I looked at Dustin and I said, shh. So, anyway. Some of you guys will get it going down the road. <laughs> Let's pray, and then we can go hide eggs and be with our family. Father, thank you for a beautiful morning. And Father, we just thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins. And Father, uh, what a blessing it's been to be here this morning, Father, and, and uh, allowing us to gather here in such a wonderful service. That uh, uh, Thank you for the message that you laid on Dustin's heart to give to us. And Father... We just ask as uh, we go out this uh, out our separate ways today, Lord, to just keep us happy and joyful and, and uh, uh, let us have an open mind to everything that's going on around us, Father. And Father, thank you for everything that you will do and uh, everything that you continue to do for us, Father. And it's these things we ask in your sweet son's precious name. Amen. <laughs>